You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 194, by Rudolf Steiner, entitled Michael's Mission, Revealing the Essential Secrets of Human Nature, Twelve Lectures Given in Dornach, Switzerland, between the 21st of November and the 15th of December, 1919, translated by Joanna Collis, or Johanna Collis. Lecture 1, Given in Dornach, on the 21st of November, 1919. Over the coming days, I shall be speaking about how we human beings of the present time have the opportunity to form a relationship with that spiritual power about which it can be said that as the power of Michael, it is able to intervene in spiritual and thus also in all other events on the earth. Today it will be necessary to prepare for what we shall be saying. We shall have to approach the subject from various points of view, which will make it possible for us to give a proper account, on the basis of the symptoms we see all around us, of the different interventions emanating from the power just mentioned. In order to speak in all seriousness about the spiritual world, We must remember always to pay attention to what is visible in the physical world in the shape of revelations from the spiritual powers. One must endeavor to penetrate, as it were, the veil of the physical world in order to reach what is at work in the spiritual world. What is present in the physical world can be observed by any one of us. What is at work in the spiritual world then helps us solve the riddles posed by the physical world. The important thing is to develop a real sense for the riddles posed by the physical world. In these important matters, entirely serious attention must be paid to what I have been saying during the period of time that has preceded these current lectures. One cannot apply one's personal views about the world when endeavoring to reach a true understanding of something that involves not only humanity as a whole, but indeed the whole world as such. One must divest oneself of merely personal interests. The best way for us to gain an understanding of our task in the world and of how we can be of value there is to free ourselves from what is personal in the narrower sense. As you know, our evolution, the evolution we understand to be that of the earth, was preceded by another evolution, so that in fact we find ourselves planted firmly within an entire cosmic evolution. You know, firstly, that this evolution is progressing and that it has reached a point beyond which it will continue to develop further toward more advanced stages. And secondly, you also know that when we consider the world as such, we are involved not only with the beings we encounter here on earth, those of the mineral, animal, plant, and human kingdoms, but also with entities who stand above those kingdoms, whom we have described as beings of the higher hierarchies. Whenever we speak about evolution as a whole, we have to pay attention also to those higher hierarchies. These beings in their turn also evolve. The analogy of our own human evolution and of the other kingdoms of the earth can help us understand this. Please consider how we human beings have made our way through a Saturn, a Sun and a Moon evolution and have now arrived on our earth. Looking at our cosmic evolution in this way, We can say that in our present earthly surroundings 
we now find ourselves in the fourth stage of our evolution. When we consider the beings who are at the stage immediately above our own human stage, the anguloi, we can say of them simply as an analogy, although their forms are entirely different from those of human existence, and although we cannot perceive them with our physical human senses, they have reached the evolutionary stage of Jupiter. And as for the archangeloi, we see that they are at the evolutionary stage which humanity will have reached on Venus. And the archai, the spirits of time, those beings who have a very special significance for us in our earthly evolution, have meanwhile progressed to the Vulcan stage of evolution. This now brings us to the meaningful question concerning the next higher class of beings, those belonging to the hierarchy of the spirits of form. If we ask what stage these spirits of form have reached, we have to say that they have moved beyond what we as human beings can discern as the Vulcan evolution, beyond what we can as yet conceive of as our future evolution. These spirits of form have reached a stage beyond the seven stages of which we can have any understanding, and they are now at the eighth stage of evolution. We can say that while we human beings are now at the fourth stage of evolution, the spirits of form are at the eighth stage. But we cannot imagine this sequence of evolutionary stages as happening one after the other, for we must realize that everything is jumbled together. Just like the atmosphere surrounding and penetrating the earth, the eighth sphere of evolution to which the spirits of form belong penetrates the sphere in which, as human beings, we find ourselves at present. So, let us now look closely at these two stages of evolution. As human beings, we are now in a sphere which has reached the fourth stage of evolution. But while initially ignoring everything else, we also find ourselves in the kingdom which the spirits of form consider to be theirs, yet which is all around us and within us too. We can now consider the human being in his development. We have frequently made distinctions between the various components of this human being. We have differentiated the head development from the other aspects of the human being's development. We also divide the rest of the development into that of the breast and that of the limbs, but we shall ignore this further division for the present. For now, let us take the standpoint that the human being consists of everything belonging to the head and everything present in the other parts of his makeup. If you see this as a picture, see, and there's a drawing, plate one, you can think of the surface of an ocean in which the human being is wading and moving forward with only his head above the surface. This is, of course, only a picture, but it shows the present situation of the human being. Everything in which the head is rooted would have to be counted as belonging to the fourth stage of evolution while that in which he is wading or swimming forward would have to be described as the eighth stage of evolution. The remarkable fact is that with his head the human being has, in a way, grown beyond the element in which the spirits of form unfold their own specific being. With regard to the formation of his head, the human being has become, you might say, emancipated, from what is fully impregnated by the characteristics of the spirits of form. Only by fully understanding this can one truly acquire an understanding of the human being. Only through this can one fully grasp the special status the human being has in the world. Only on this basis can we rightly grasp the fact that although the human being senses a certain creative influence within himself, that emanates from the spirits of form, 
This influence reaches him not through the capacities of his head, but through the effect the other parts of his organism have on his head. As you know, we breathe, and speaking in ordinary physiological terms, our breathing is connected with the circulation of our blood. Our blood is also driven up into our head. In this way, our head lives in an organic connection with the other parts of our organism. It is nourished and enlivened by the rest of our organism. You must distinguish clearly between these two facts. The one is that the head is in direct contact with the outside world. When you see something, you are seeing it with your eyes. This is a direct connection between the outside world and your head. But, on the other hand, when you consider how your head lives through the breathing process and the circulation of the blood, you see how the blood shoots up into your head. Here, there is no direct link between your head and the environment, but only an indirect one. Of course, you shouldn't be pedantic about this and say that we inhale the air we breathe through our mouth, so breathing also belongs to the head. That is why I said that this is only a picture. Organically, What we inhale through our mouth is not really connected with our head. It belongs to the other parts of our organism. The basic concept here is that we are living in two spheres. Firstly, in the sphere into which we have been placed by having undergone the Saturn, Sun and Moon evolutions. So that we have now arrived at the Earth evolution and are thus at the fourth stage of our evolution. And secondly, we are also living in a sphere which belongs to the spirits of form, in the same way that the earth evolution belongs to us, while our head is excluded from it, from the other parts of our organism, with all our sense impressions, exist in this eighth sphere. Once you have taken all this into account, you will have some basis upon which to consider what is to follow. But first I want to mention yet other concepts to contribute to this basis. Further necessary influences to be considered are the beings who also participate in world events, as I have often mentioned, the Luciferic and the Aramonic beings. Let us look first at what one might call the most external elements belonging to the Luciferic and Aramonic beings. Together with us they inhabit the spheres which we also inhabit. In considering the most external characteristics of the Luciferic beings, we have to regard them as possessing those forces which we human beings feel when we want to give way to fantasy in a one-sided way, when we enter into visionary reverie, when, speaking in pictures, we want to fly up beyond the confines of our head. When, as human beings, We want to rise up beyond our head. The forces in our human organism that play a part in this are the universal forces of Luciferic beings. Imagine beings entirely formed out of something in us which strives to rise beyond our head. These are those Luciferic beings who have a certain relationship with our human world. And now, Think the reverse. Think of everything that presses us down into the earth, wanting to make of us sober Philistines and causing us to develop materialistic attitudes which fill us with dry intellectual ideas, and so on. These are the Aramonic powers. All these things which I have mentioned, more from the angle of the soul, can also be expressed in a more bodily way. One can say, the human being is always in a kind of central position between what his blood wants to do with him and what his bones want to do with him. The bones perpetually want to rigidify us. In other words, they constantly want to harden us and make us aramonic, 
in our body too. Blood, though, wants to drive us out of ourselves. Pathologically speaking, blood can become feverish, so that the human being is also driven organically into the realm of fantasy. And the bones can envelop the whole organism in their nature, making the human being bony and sclerotic, as happens to almost all of us in old age to some extent. That is when the human being carries the death-bringing element within himself, the aramonic element. One could say that everything in the blood tends toward the luciferic, and everything in the bones tends toward the aramonic while the human being holds the balance between them. From the point of view of the soul, he must hold the balance between too much sentiment and too much sober philistinism. In a certain way, we could also characterize these two beings more profoundly. When we consider what is interesting for the Luciferic beings in matters of the cosmos, we find that their main interest is to make the human world disloyal to those spiritual beings whom we should consider to be the creators of humanity and the human world. The Luciferic beings want nothing other than to make the world stray from the divine beings, although not in the first instance in order to take over the world for themselves. From various comments I have already made, about the Luciferic beings, you will understand that this is not their main aim. For them, the main aim is to disengage the world from that which the human being feels to be his own divine beings, to keep the world free of these. The purpose of the Aramonic beings is different. It is their firm intention to bring the human realm and thus the rest of the earth into their own sphere of influence to make it, and especially first of all the human beings, dependent on them. Whereas the Luciferic beings have always been and still are intent on making human beings defect from what they sense to be their own sphere of divinity, the Aramonic beings tend more toward capturing humanity together with all that is related to it, and integrating it into their sphere of influence. Thus, there is in our cosmos, the cosmos with which we as human beings are interwoven, a battle between the Luciferic beings who are perpetually striving for freedom, for universal freedom, and the Aramonic beings who strive unceasingly for power and strength. This battle, which is all around us, permeates everything. So, now I ask you to retain the second idea that is important for our considerations. The world in which we live is permeated by Luciferic and Aramonic beings, so that there exists the tremendous contradiction between the liberating tendency of the Luciferic beings and the urge of the Aramonic beings to exercise power. Once you pay attention to this, you will say to yourself, I can properly comprehend the world only when I look at it in relation to the number three. On the one hand, there is everything that is luciferic, and on the other, everything that is aramonic. And between the two is the human being, as the third element, who cannot help but create a balance between the two in sensing his own divinity. We can only reach an understanding of the world if we take this trinity as the basis and realize clearly that our human life is like the balancing beam of the scales. And there's another drawing. Here is the balancing beam. And on this side is one pan of the scales, the luciferic one, pulling upward. And here on the other side is the aramonic one, dragging downward. What maintains the balancing beam in the horizontal position is the being of man. Initiates who understood such mysteries in the past always maintained with regard to human evolution 
that the world existence into which humanity has been placed can only be comprehended on the basis of the number three. In its basic structure, it cannot be comprehended on the basis of any other number. Speaking in our language, we may may therefore say that in world existence, Lucifer represents one pan of the scales and arm on the other, while between them the balance is maintained by the Christ impulse. One might well imagine that the Luciferic and Aramonic powers would be rather interested in hiding this mystery of the number three. After all, a proper understanding of this mystery of the number three would enable human beings to bring about a balance between the Aramonic and the Luciferic powers. In other words, on the one hand, they would be free to use what is Luciferic for the good of cosmic aims. And on the other hand, the same would be the case with regard to what is Aramonic. The most normal spiritual state of mind for the human being consists in entering in the right way into this threefoldness, this trinity of the world, this world structure, insofar as it is based on the number three. As we shall consider in more depth tomorrow and the next day, regarding influences which are brought to bear on human spiritual and cultural life, there was and is a strong tendency to confuse human beings with regard to the significance of the number three. There is a strong tendency to bamboozle them with regard to what we may truly call this sacred number three. In more recent culture, we can observe very clearly how this structuring in accordance with the number three has come to be almost entirely obliterated by the number two. Just consider, as I have frequently discussed here, that even to understand Goethe's Faust rightly, one has to know how confusion regarding the number three plays into this great drama about the world. If in his day Goethe had fully understood the true situation, he would have confronted Faust not only with Mephistopheles, who, as we know, represents the Aramonic power, but also with the Luciferic power. Then Lucifer and Mephistopheles would both have appeared in Faust. I have frequently explained this here. If you study Goethe's Mephistopheles character, you will see clearly how Goethe everywhere mixes together the Luciferic and Aramonic elements in the character of Mephistopheles. In Goethe's work, the figure of Mephistopheles is a compound of two elements. He is not a uniform character. Luciferic and Aramonic elements are thoroughly mixed together. I have gone into this more deeply in my booklet about Goethe's Faust. This confusion which also played its part in Faust, is the result of a delusion which has taken hold in more recent times. Things were different earlier on. That the number two is applicable in place of the number three. Good on the one side and evil on the other. God and the devil. Please remember, therefore, that to gain any insight into the structure of the world, we must take account of the number three where the Luciferic and the Aramonic elements are in opposition to one another and where the divine element of God consists in holding the balance between the two. In opposition to this, we have the mistaken illusion of the number two which has entered into humanity's cultural development, God and the devil, with the divine powers above and the diabolical ones down below. The human being has been as though squeezed out of the balance by having had concealed from him the fact that the true salvation of the world, understanding, lies in a proper comprehension of the number three, and by having been shown instead that the structure of the world is governed by the number two. Despite everything, even the best human endeavors have fallen prey to this error. If we want to enter into this matter, we must do so very much without any prejudice. We must, absolutely,
place ourselves out there in the sphere where there is no prejudice. And then we must also make a clear distinction between things and names. We must not be tempted to assume that by having given a being a specific name, we have already gained a full sense of what that being is. When we look at those beings whom we should feel to be divine beings for humanity, we must realize that we can only have a true sense of who they are when we think of them as holding the balance between the Luciferic and the Aramonic principle. In seeking the divine, we shall never fully find it if we do not enter properly into this matter of threefolding. Look at Milton's poem titled Paradise Lost or Klopstock's titled Der Messias, which was influenced by Paradise Lost. These show no true comprehension of a threefold universal structure. They tell of an assumed battle between heaven and hell and in this way contribute to bringing the delusion of a duality into our cultural development. Here we have the illusion of a combat between heaven and hell being brought into our popular culture by two universally known more modern poems. There is no point in the way Milton or Klopstock speaks of the beings of heaven as divine beings. They can only be what human beings should know as divine beings if the foundation on which they stand is the threefold structure of the world. Only then would one be able to say, here is a battle between the good principle and the evil principle. But as things stand, goodness is attributed to a duality, with names taken from what is actually divine and given to beings who are devilish, who are an anti-divine element. What is the consequence of this in reality? This actually amounts to nothing less than pushing the divine out of our consciousness. The Luciferic element is given the name of the divine so that the battle is between Lucifer and Araman, with Araman being accorded Luciferic characteristics, while the divine characteristics are attributed to the realm of Lucifer. This shows us how momentous such a view can become. A confrontation such as that shown in Milton's Paradise Lost or Klopstock's Messias is said to be a conflict between divine and diabolical elements, whereas in truth it is about the Luciferic and the Aramonic element. There is no awareness of a truly divine element, but instead the divine names are attributed to the Luciferic element. Milton's Paradise Lost and Klopstock's Messias are spiritual creations arising out of more recent human consciousness. What takes place in these works belongs to the general consciousness of humanity. The illusion of the number two has taken up residence in more recent human consciousness, while the truth of the number three has been pushed into the background. Profound creations emanating from humanity in recent times, which with some justification are regarded as being among the greatest productions of these times, are a cultural maya, a great delusion, which has arisen out of recent humanity's great delusion. What is at work in this illusion is basically a creation emanating from Aramonic influences, those influences which will one day come to full concentration in the incarnation of Araman, about which I have already spoken to you. This illusion, in the midst of which we find ourselves, is nothing other than the result of that false view of the world, which has been making its appearance everywhere in recent civilization, and which places heaven into opposition with hell. Heaven is looked upon as being divine, while hell is seen as being diabolical, whereas on the one hand it is the Luciferic elements that are termed divine, while on the other the Aramonic elements are termed diabolical. We need only consider what interests have come into play during more recent cultural history. Even the threefolding ordering of the human organism 
or indeed of the human being as a whole, was abolished in a certain sense by the Ecumenical Council of Constantinople in the year 869. The dogma was established that Christians must believe not in the threefold, but in a twofold being of man. Belief in body, soul, and spirit was frowned upon, and medieval theologians and philosophers, who still knew a great deal about the truth, had great difficulties in getting around this because belief in body, soul, and spirit was declared a heresy. They were obliged to teach the dichotomy. The human being consists of body and soul, not body and soul and spirit. And this is why replacing the trichotomy with the dichotomy makes such an immense difference for human spiritual life that certain individuals know only too well. One must face up to such depths if one wants to understand what the Jesuit Father Zimmermann is referring to in the November issue of titled Stimmen der Zeit. It states that a recent decree promulgated by the Council of Rome prevents Catholics from receiving absolution after confession if they read or possess theosophical writings or participate in any way in theosophical matters. This Jesuit father interprets that article in Stimmen der Zeit, which used to be known as Teil Stimmen aus Maria Lach, as a specific reference to my anthroposophy, so that everything ought to be done to prevent Catholics who want to be regarded as genuine Roman Catholics from occupying their minds with anthroposophical literature. One of the main reasons given is that the human being is seen to consist of body, soul, and spirit. In other words, that we teach something heretical, since the proper belief consists in regarding the human being as having a body and a soul. I mentioned just now that the distinction between body and soul has come upon modern philosophers without their being aware of this. They think they are conducting unprejudiced scientific thought. They genuinely believe that observation has shown them that the human being consists of body and soul. Yet in actual fact, all they too are doing is following that dogma which has entered into more recent scientific development. What is nowadays regarded as science is actually entirely dependent upon ways of thinking which have been imposed during the course of more recent human evolution. Do not imagine that the few kind words you feel you ought to address to these people will convert their conviction that anthroposophy is a heresy, or that you can persuade them to regard anthroposophy sympathetically. Anthroposophy must find its own way into the world without protection from any other powers, however strongly Christian they may consider themselves to be. Anthroposophy can only achieve through inner strength what it is intended to achieve in the world. You must remember that the Christ impulse can only be comprehended if it is regarded as the impulse of balance between what is Aramonic and what is Luciferic, if it is properly installed within the Trinity. What is it that can be done, one might ask, in order to mislead people regarding the true Christ impulse? One would have to distract them from the true structure of the world based on the number three and lead them instead to the illusion of the number two, which is solely justifiable in matters that are outwardly manifest, but not in matters that lie hidden behind what is outwardly manifest, but are present in the sphere of truth. We must begin to realize that in such matters one has to progress beyond mere names. Merely by using the name of Christ does not mean that we have properly characterized the Christ. And one can prevent the Christ from being properly characterized solely by being named if one puts the number two in the place of the number three. 
if someone wanted to steer people away from a proper conception of Christ, that person would merely need to put the number two in the place of the number three. So if the Christ impulse is to be spoken of in the true sense, then it is necessary to replace the number two by the number three. There is, though, no need as of today to condemn people on account of their heresy. You do not have to describe Milton's Paradise Lost or Klopstock's Messias as infernal writings of the devil, for you can, of course, still enjoy the beauty and greatness of these writings. But you must be clear about the fact that such works, in so far as they represent the flower of popular human civilization, have absolutely nothing to say about Christ. Such writings are based on the erroneous assumption that whatever does not comply with human evolution has to be counted among what comes from the devil, while, on the other hand, one also has what is divine. No. All that one has is something luciferic. And if one then writes about a lost paradise, one is in reality describing the expulsion of mankind from the realm of Lucifer into the realm of Araman. So, what is being described is not the yearning of mankind for the divine, but the yearning of mankind for the realm of Lucifer. What you are seeing in Milton's Paradise Lost and in Klopstock's Messias are descriptions of humanity's longing for the realm of Lucifer, and this is all you should see in them. Certain ideas that have been taken up by modern humanity are therefore very much in need of reassessment. In preparing seriously to think and feel anthroposophically, we are today not faced by small decisions, but by momentous ones. We are faced with having to take very seriously something frequently said by Nietzsche. His words about the reassessment of certain values must be taken very, very seriously. What humanity has achieved in recent times will have to be very much reassessed. There is no need, however, to condemn heretics out of hand. We continue to perform scenes from Goethe's Faust, and I have devoted decades to the study of Goethe. You will read in my small book, titled Goethe's Geistesart, that this has not blinded me to Goethe's wrong characterization of Mephistopheles. But merely to say that Goethe's Mephistopheles is wrong, so let's get rid of him, would be rather a narrow-minded reaction. That is how those who pronounce judgment on heretics behave. And as modern individuals, we ought not to place ourselves in this position. On the other hand, though, we should not take the easy way out by allowing the newer pronouncements of general cultural life to become ingrained in us. It will be necessary for humanity to learn a very great deal. We shall have to revalue many things. All these things are bound up with the mission of Micaiah in regard to those beings of the higher hierarchies with whom he, in his turn, is connected. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, we shall have more to say about how we may comprehend those impulses which radiate from him into our human existence on earth. The end of Lecture 1